Welcome to the Mindfully Masculine Podcast with Charles and Dan, where we take a conscious, holistic, and direct approach to relationships, mental health, and self-improvement. For additional content, visit our website at mindfullymasculine.com. And to interact with us, our guests, and your fellow listeners, join the Mindfully Masculine group on Facebook. Good morning, sir. How are you? I'm well, Dan. How are you? I'm well as well. Excellent. All right. You ready to uh, not talk to another person or about Jordan Peterson? Uh, no, I, <laughs> I have not prepared myself for such an amazing event. Yeah, it's, it's exciting to uh, have another episode that's just the two of us without the personality inspector of Jordan Peterson sitting on our shoulders while we talk about him. To be honest, I'm glad we did it. It was a learning experience. I think yes, both I, of us um, I, yeah, on, my, a, on many levels. Agreed. I, I learned, uh, I've learned a lot from that book, both times that I've uh, really gotten into it. I mean, obviously the second time doing it with you for the podcast, I went much deeper than the first time I read it. And, and there, there are a lot of principles that, uh, I'm sure will stick with me for the rest of my life, but, uh, you know, it's, it's heavy stuff and it's, uh, and trying to know it so well that we can talk about it and share it with other people that, that burns a lot of, a lot of brain watts to, uh, to be that into the material, you know, correct. And, and also talking about it twice a week and putting in editing two episodes a week and all that stuff. It was, it was a lot. You definitely have the, the lion's share of the, the work when it comes to processing that, you know, the material and, and creating it. And so I, you know, thank you for that. I appreciate that. Um, no you problem. Know, yeah. But it, it, you know, in the end, if we can't remember anything, what's, what's the point of going through it? Right. So yeah, by, yeah. by going through it in this manner and presenting it this way, it definitely has cemented a lot more in my mind than it nor than most books normally do when I'm going through them on sure. Audible. No, absolutely. Can you, um, is there any particular thing or things that really stood out the most for you that you're taking away from that experience? Yeah, actually that people can be brutal. <laughs> That human beings, yeah, you know, it, it can be violent, and we, it's it's surprising. We should be more surprised when people are kind and generous and thoughtful and and nice, and not be shocked when they act brutally, right? And I that flipped for me. I was 180 degrees the other direction. Because yeah. I, w I was lucky enough to have a, a great, you know, childhood and parents who, who, you know, who loved me and showed me love. And so that was my, that was my point of view that, well, that's just the way everybody is. Yeah. And that's everybody's default. And, and that's <laughs> not the case. Yeah. It definitely reminds me of, uh, I mean, how easy we have it in, in the West in the 21st century, like how many of our, of our baser desires are have have been like we've the west has done a pretty good job of uh putting together societies where i mean we don't get all the incentives right and obviously they're you know life's not perfect but compared to the entirety of human history we're doing pretty well right now you know about you know getting getting the best out of people instead of allowing them to be at their worst yeah and contrasting that with the last chapter where, you know, pet a cat when you see one on the street in terms yeah. of appreciate the, the nice moments you have and that you find in life where you're feeling good and things are good and you're feeling happy. And he just helped me remember that those are, you know, those are relatively rare. And, and so now when I have a moment where I'm enjoying myself, I definitely savor it a little bit more. Yeah. Um, I try to do that too. And I mean, specifically the, 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 the two biggest truths I remember from that book, or I want to remember from that book are, you know, and, and you and I repeat it to each other constantly, that idea of what's the smallest thing I could do that I would do that could make things a little bit better. That's, that's a huge one that I'm taking away from it, you know, after going through it the second time. And the other one is this idea of 
or whatever is going wrong in your life, take as much responsibility for it as you can, but no more responsibility than that. You know, like try to try to be as responsible as you can possibly be without lying to yourself about being more responsible than you actually are. Yeah. I don't think people have that problem these days taking too much responsibility for stuff. I think that's, that's a rare thing. I think it's more, Hey, not my fault. I think the rare, it's the economy. It's, it's, it's the president. It's, you know, um, that it does, it does seem like that is, is the direction that people tend to lean too much, but you know, it's hard to say, it's hard to say what's going on in somebody's head. Like, is that what they're putting forward publicly because internally they feel absolutely terrible and responsible for every bad thing that happens? I mean, I think that is, I think that is a way that people can function sometimes and, and we don't really get a, a complete view into that. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. I mean, everybody's individual, right? So of course there's going to be people just like what you described. I, you know, I met one yesterday, you know, and, yeah. and where she was basically, yeah, we went out afterwards, went out to a bar and there was a guy in a wheelchair sitting there by himself with a beer and um, one of the girls that we were with, she she's like, oh, you know, I feel so bad for this guy. I mean, somebody just put him put him up next to a table there and he's there by himself and nobody's talking to him. And I'm like, I- I'm sure he's OK, you know, yeah. and 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 she's like, no, no, no. And she made one of her other friends go over and talk to him. And oh, so this girl went over, sat down next to him and was there maybe five minutes and came back. And she goes. Yeah, he's. He he's the quote homeless as shit. <laughs> so, <laughs> wow. Okay. And uh, she's like, she's like, no, he's, he's, you know, he, he's not all there, you know? And, and she's like this, he was not like a, you know, a, 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 a lonely, you know, disabled old man who was suffering in any way. He was a bit of a jerk, you know? Um, so, yeah. um, and, and this was, and, and, you know, so the, the one girl who made her friend go over and, and or guilted her friend until she right. went over there, she yeah. said she'd make her, uh, you know, it was, it just shows, you know, and, and then through the night, as she was talking about other things, she would be, you know, she, I could see she had like anxiety about a lot yeah. of things that were really not her responsibility right. or, or not, you know, but she was upset about them, you know? So, uh, you know, to reinforce what you said, I was seeing this firsthand actually last night. And I thought that was, that was interesting. Um, she was, she was also upset that, you know, she was going to have to move because of her work situation mm. and she couldn't find an apartment. And, you know, she, it was, she was struggling for sure. And she was like visibly upset about this. And yeah. Yeah. And anxiety is a tough one. And knowing, knowing how much responsibility to take for your situation and how much to just, you know, kind of write off to the nature of the world. It's, it's hard to figure out what that is. I was listening to a, a great podcast episode yesterday. Um, it was Glennon Doyle's podcast that she has with her wife and their guest was Brene Brown. And, uh, and, and they were talking about, you know, just, connection and you know when when you're having conflict with someone or or someone close to you is going through something difficult like how do you how do you stay connected to them and give them what they need instead of just what you think they need and how do you stop yourself from you know just it 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 seems it seems like a a very worthy and worthwhile skill to develop where you can talk to someone or look at someone and know what emotion they're currently experiencing or going through but Brene Brown's point was like, you really can't, we really can't do that. We think we can, but we can't like, it's, it's very, you know, I think uh, her Atlas of the heart, I think she talks about like the 87 different emotions or something that like this ridiculously high number of emotions that people can feel. And like, we all think that we can look at someone and tell whether they're sad versus angry versus frustrated versus, you know, there's all these emotions that manifest manifest themselves so closely to other emotions and based on what's going on inside of us, we look at that person. We like uh, we know exactly what they're going through. We know exactly what they're feeling. And so she was basically making the point that the more you understand yourself, the more capability you have to understand other people. And if you can't understand yourself, you have like no chance of being able to understand other people. 
Yeah, I that, I actually mentioned that on the last podcast we did with my dad yeah. Bev was yeah the, the Alice of the Heart and it, the fact is when they panned the audience after she said we have eighty seven different emotions that they identified everybody's face like dropped it's like there's eighty seven it's like eighty seven different flavors of ice cream or you know, it's, it's it's overwhelming right and so yeah. you're right if you can't define specifically all of those shades of emotion that you could possibly have, how are you supposed to then really be able to understand somebody else and communicate, yeah. you know, how they're feeling and, and even ask the right questions to understand what they're feeling, what, what the options are. Right. So it's like you say all the time is if, you know, if you're a carpenter, every solution, you know, use a hammer yeah. for every solution. Right. And, and yeah. that's, if that you only have one or two emotions that you can identify, then you're going to think, all right, well, either the person's sad or happy or right. And, and if that's all the only ones you, you can identify and, and know. So I think that's the program, <clears throat> excuse me, on HBO max that I'm, I'm going to finish from Brene Brown. That sounds great. Yeah. Uh, they were, they were talking about it on, on that podcast and it, it sounds really good. I don't know if I, if I should read the book first and then watch it, or if I should watch it, then read the book. Um, yeah. I think I am going to commit to going through Brene Brown's entire her whole library. I'm just going to read all the books in order and uh, try to delve a little bit deeper into, into what she's about. Cause every time I hear her talk on a Ted talk, the Netflix special podcast interviews, she just strikes me as a brilliant deep thinker that cares about people. And there's, there's not a ton of people that I could put in that category, you know? And she, and she backs it up with data, with, yes, with absolutely. science, you yeah. know, with studies. So it, it really adds credibility and oh, the yeah. way she presents, I like it too. It's entertaining yeah, and it's very digestible and that's why she's so successful. Yeah. One of the, one of the biggest takeaways I, I took from, from this interview that I listened to yesterday was this question that she says to ask when somebody you care about is going through something, Okay, say to them what does love look like for you right now? Or what does support look like for you right now? And then just let them tell you and then do the thing that they're telling you. I would be interested to find out how many people can even answer that question. Cause I know when I'm really feeling upset about something, I don't even know if I could answer what support looks like for me right now. Yeah, I know. I mean, it, it requires work from both parties to be and, able to turn that into something and, useful. And in an interesting way, I wonder if, just making somebody think of that actually helps them in some way, right? It helps them help themselves a little bit. I think it would. I mean, if, right? somebody asked, if somebody asked me that question when I was going through something hard, even though I might not know how to answer that question, I would feel like I was, you know, a trapeze artist that somebody just put out a safety net under. And how good does that feel, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And it kind of gives you power because it's like, what do you need? And they're like, oh, well, huh, let me, let me use my imagination here. Let me, let's, right. get, let's get creative. Let's see. And you really kind of dig into your feelings and, and what would make you feel better. So I think that's, it's a powerful question that gets you back on, back on track. Yeah. And the, the other big thing I took away was this idea that uh, Glenn Doyle, the host actually brought up was, um, cause I, I feel I identify with a lot of the stories that she tells, um, and, and when she talks about her personality and, and the way she is and the way she feels like she needs to be in relationships where she can be a bit controlling. She can feel like, you know, she, she has to control people and she has to control situations because it'll just work out for everybody concerned if she's just in charge. And I, I definitely oh. have, I just I have a little bit of that instinct as well. Yeah. And one of the things she did on yes on that episode I listened to yesterday was she contrasted the idea with the need to feel control only happens when there's a vacuum of trust. When when you don't trust the other person to take care of themselves, to take care of you, then the way you respond to that is with a need to control things. And if you if you learn to trust yourself, if you learn to trust the other person, if you learn to trust the relationship that you're in, you can minimize that need to control all of those things. I could see that also happening if you don't feel secure in the environment that you're in. And yeah. you don't feel safe. Right. I could see that triggering a similar type of control or need for control when things around you, you don't trust entirely either. Right. And I mean, a lot of that, a lot of that comes from attachment wounds from childhood. Like a lot of us find ourselves in situations where no matter, no matter how stable and secure they actually are, they will never feel that way because 
they remind us too much of previously unstable, insecure situations, and we we can't separate them. So, yeah, it's uh, it was it was a good podcast episode. It was it was Brene Brown's most no second most recent appearance on the uh, on Glenn Doyle's podcast, which is called "We Can Do Hard Things," which I think is a great name for a uh, a podcast. Maybe the second best name for a podcast I've ever heard. Definitely, <laughs> definitely number two. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's definitely a competition for silver since uh, Mindfully Masculine came on the scene. <laughs> Agreed. So, uh, but yeah, it was it was really good, and I really I really enjoyed it. Hey, Dan, welcome back. Thank you, sir. <laughs> let's uh, let's figure out a time to finish getting that computer set up, huh? Oh, technical difficulties. Yeah, technical so we can't do it tonight because we're we're going dancing. Yes, yes, and it, so technically it was. Um, it's actually not Nanette's dance. It is the. Okay. I think it's the city of Deltona that are, is putting it on at the center. It's an '80s themed dance, but they finally allowed Nanette to market for her classes at okay, the dance. Gotcha. That's okay. the and so she's going to be teaching a swing lesson, which you probably could teach at this point. You've had, you've done so much oh, East Coast swing. All that. Well, I don't know about the triple step. You're good with the single step, right? So yeah. did you have you learned any triple step with oh, your, yeah. With yeah, your yeah. teacher? Okay. Yeah, cool. yeah. I've I've done that. I just I just don't like the triple step as much. One of the reasons is because the uh the the left hand hold well left for left for the lead and um right hand for the follower is down low instead of instead of up in the traditional frame so i don't i don't like it as much because you hold you hold their hand low instead of holding their hand high oh i didn't know that you changed the handhold based you on do. whether you're doing single or triple you do oh, yeah interesting because the idea is because single is so much faster when you're gonna signal a turn your hand has to already be up pretty high because you have to you have to go you have to move got so it. quickly i got it that makes Where, sense yeah. So yeah, single single step is for faster songs. And and I like I like the way swing looks when it's faster than slower. But uh I don't know. We'll we'll see how it goes. Yeah. Yeah. Well Nanette will be teaching, I think, the triple step. I'm sure, so yeah, I, yeah. 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 Jeannie was saying that they only really do triple step. So mm -hmm. um, but really every move you learn in triple step, you can you can apply to single step. And Victoria taught me that, you know, if I like single step better, I could just do single step, but just do it slower and add a little bit more, you know, upper and lower body movement to it to give it a little razzle dazzle. Awesome. And this is an 80s themed. Yeah. What does dance? that mean? So what do you, gonna, I, yeah. you can, you can get an 80s themed t-shirt at Target these days. You know, one of those retro. I would never wear a t-shirt to a dance. How dare you suggest that? Well, I'll be wearing a t-shirt to the dance. So <laughs> Which feel, one? feel free to make sure, make fun of me. It's a uh, Nintendo controller. It's a brown 80s themed Nintendo controller t-shirt. That is pretty 80s. And I will be attempting to keep my mullet on for the entirety of the oh, dance. I forgot, I forgot we'll you're, see. you're, you're, you're yes. using fake hair again. Fake hair. Huh. Didn't really work out for Halloween. My pirate that lasted like an hour and I sweat through it again. My, my research has told me that when it comes to wearing wigs for a costume, you either go expensive or you skip it. So good luck. This, this one's supposedly ventilated and I, I trimmed, I trimmed my, my real hair. So hopefully it'll be a lot less heat coming from it. Yeah, so there's we'll no way, there's no way that it's not made out of plastic though. And how, how comfortable can one get when you're wearing plastic hair? I don't know. I we'll I'll, have ask, I'll have to ask all my Lego men. We'll have to see how uh, how long until it ends up in a garbage can at the Deltona Center. <laughs> or actually, you could send it if you got it from Amazon. You could just send it back. They'll they'll take stuff back for any reason. That's a great point. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, I don't know exactly what I'll wear. Uh, maybe I'll wear my space te my space uh, themed uh, button down shirt because space oh, yeah. was big, space was a big deal in the eighties. That's right. Not, not quite as much anymore. We'll uh yeah. So we're gonna do that. I don't know how much I, I'll be there for the lesson. I don't know how much I'll be there after the lesson's over though. Yeah, I'm I'm there mostly to support Nanette. So yeah, and uh how much is it? It's like 10 or 15 bucks. 10 bucks. 10 bucks. I think I can bucks. swing. I think I can swing that. Yeah. Um, okay. So let's see, and then the rest of the weekend. Uh oh, yeah, tomorrow night, the Aloha Beautiful party for guys with ties, which we are a proud sponsor of. Hello fantastic were you able to get the logo over oh, yeah. to yeah they've they've since shared it on their instagram story and everything 
Oh, I haven't seen that. Excellent. Yeah, take take a look. Gram. They uh, they've got the 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 graphic for the party, and our our logo is is featured somewhat prominently. Excellent. I'm so excited should, for that. We should gonna, be ready to uh, talk about uh, when people come and ask us about our podcast. We should be ready to talk about it. Now, do you have a a song that you're gonna sing? Because uh, it is a karaoke themed bar. Man, you know the. Uh, I have I have mentioned the fact that I would like to do karaoke at some time during calendar 2022. I do not believe tomorrow will be the time that I do it. <laughs> the, the commitment to try karaoke and the commitment to not drink alcohol, those seem to be very mutually exclusive. I don't know if those two are going to be able to uh, come to the table and work out a compromise. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you've got a good voice. I have a deep voice. That is not the same as having a good voice. Fair. <laughs> Maybe I, have a, Fair. I have a good talking voice. I do yeah. not have a good singing voice. In fact, I would I would argue that my deep voice is a handicap when it comes to singing any form of popular music. So I, I don't know how that's going to work out. There's There are a couple of uh, Sinatra songs that come close to being in my vocal range, but they're still a little too high. Uh, maybe you should look to Johnny Cash. Maybe, yeah, maybe I should look to somebody who, uh, or Barry White. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, yes. Or uh, or somebody who doesn't actually sing, they just kind of talk their way through music. Maybe yeah. maybe that's even better. Yeah, we'll have to do some research. Yeah, so, okay, well, uh, and then Sunday, I don't have anything really planned on Sunday. Next week's going to be pretty big. I'm doing two nights at, at uh, Disney. I'm lo- really looking forward to that because... I've been my my pirate pass has been blocked out for the for like two weeks, which is usually okay because the two weeks that I'm blocked out for are the ones that are full of children on spring break. So it's like normally I wouldn't really care. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I've I've discovered so many fun things to do at Disney that don't require you to stand in long lines for a ride that I, I think I would still enjoy the parks during the busy times. But Disney's like, nope, you can't go. And I got to get in all my Disney time as well I can because, you know, the state of Florida is going to be putting them out of business soon on yeah. account of the, uh, the parental rights law or the don't say gay law, which however you want to call it based on what side of the issue you're on. It's uh, yeah, it's looking it's looking pretty, pretty messy. We'll see. We'll see how this uh, works itself out. Yeah, and I, I saw something about that. Um, the, the counties now are going to have to take over some of. The, if if this happens, they're going to take us some take over some of the the debts and things like that that Disney has. And yeah, it it does not look like a very straightforward process. I can't imagine that it would be, but um, I I wouldn't think that Disney would have debt on anything. But yeah, you know, well, hey, look, I mean, the I idea is I don't so, run my own city, so <laughs> right. That's the thing. Yeah. So, so Disney's <laughs> I don't know how that works. Got this, they've, they've got this permission to run their municipality as they want to, and uh, yeah, if if that changes, I don't know, man. Uh, here's here's what w- without having without committing too much to a political opinion one way or the other. Here's what I will say: it does feel like to me when state governments and multinational corporations get into a chicken contest or or a game of chicken or a pissing contest whatever you want to call it it somehow feels like citizens are probably the ones that are going to get screwed over i was exactly <laughs> thinking that too yeah it doesn't it doesn't work out bad for either of the, the behemoths it's exactly. always the little people that deal with it yeah yeah exactly it's like the uh the grains of sand that get caught between the gears of this huge operation is it, it, it's it's roughest for the grains of sand it's, we're the ones that end up getting turned into glass it's unbelievable. it's you know right i mean it's like when they when a when the state wants to build a new or a you know a professional football team or or baseball right, team want exactly. to build a new stadium yeah. you know and it's like oh well we're going to create all these jobs so of course the taxpayers can pay for it for the stadium what what yeah exactly yeah, it does. It does seem like when when big companies or just ultra rich individuals, yeah, and the state of you know the state or the federal government get into a, a conflict with each other, you know, they're they're both of them are are thinking, okay, how can we how can we get out of this with what we want and pass it off to the greatest number of people? Yeah, I mean, bottom line is, I mean, the all the resources that the state has come from the people to begin with. I mean, all the money and everything else. So even the idea of, uh, you know, the, the time and energy they're putting into 
considering making these changes, that's all funded by us to begin with, you know, and yeah. now, and, and then the consequences of whatever happens and the fallout we're, we're, we're involved in some way or another. And the other thing that chaps me a little bit about the way that the government is handling their side of this is just how doggone fast they're able to move on something like this when they want to compared with how long it takes them to get other serious things done. You know what I mean? It's yeah. just like yeah. when, when there's an upper, when, there, when there's a chance to uh, score points politically and, and make a nice catchy title to your fundraising email about look at what we did to Disney. Mm -hmm. It's like, they can work really, really fast, but when mm -hmm. it's something that's a little bit more important, um, it, uh, it goes much, much slower. So yeah, that, yep. that kind of burns yep. me a little bit, but yeah. And, and the other thing is, I don't know, Disney is, uh, on Disney's side, they didn't do a ton about this issue when they actually had a chance to do something about the issue. They came out in support of a certain side of it after it was kind of already decided. And, and now, you know, they're, they're having to play this game of chicken with the governor and the legislature, even though they didn't really do anything to, to step in and solve this thing that they're now saying is a big problem. Like when they could have done something to, to get involved in stopping this from happening. They didn't right. do anything. Right. But now they're saying a lot of nice things about it. And so they're getting some of the credit for being on the right side of the issue, but it didn't really cost them anything when it would have mattered. Right. Yeah. So, and, it, and they needed to be shamed, right. Or called out for them to even. Right. Make exactly. That stand, exactly. Right. It wasn't so, like they volunteer voluntarily. were like, Oh yeah. It, right. People had to yeah, make so a stink my, about my, it. My biggest takeaway from this whole thing is all politicians care about is power and all co corporations care about is money <laughs> and it just it surprise. just what i already believe <laughs> right surprise yeah i mean i think i think that's and that's that kind of goes back to my thoughts about you know what i learned from jordan peterson too which is you know yeah people people aren't inherently the best version that you think they are these, these fairy tale stories of, you know, people just being, you know, kind and generous by default. You right. Know, which lot, it, uh, some people are, don't get me wrong. Some I know people are, but, and, but, but that was my, that, that was where I was getting all upset when people weren't that way or when people didn't agree with me. Right. And another perspective was just like, yeah, you need to go through this world, assuming that people aren't going to agree with you. And if you find somebody that does, it's, it's rare. They're your tribe to, to find somebody who, you know, you sync with. So it's a lot less disappointing when you are disappointed. If you're going in with, with these assumptions that everybody is, is thinking the way you are. Yeah. And I feel bad to ever like be in the position where I'm talking someone into being cynical, but really when, whenever any politician from any side starts coming out and saying, you know, I'm taking a stand because I'm committed to, uh, standing up for this, you know, marginalized or disadvantaged group, where in this case, it's either uh, children on the right or LGBTQ folks on the left. It's like whenever they say, I'm, I'm going to take a hard stand because I'm standing up for these people that don't have somebody to speak for them. It's like in both cases, so much of the time, I'm like, just like, oh, really? Is that what you're really doing this for? Or you really do this so that you get reelected. Mm -hmm. And again, I, I hate I hate being cynical, but I also hate being right <laughs> when, when I am cynical. I, I I look for people to prove me wrong in these scenarios and, and really show me by their behavior that that's not what the only thing that they care about, that they actually do care about standing up for, you know, people that can't stand up for themselves. But in, in the end, it, it seems to always just come back to power and money. Yeah, right. And, and, and keeping both of those, right. You know, and, yeah. uh, you know, you're seeing that you're seeing a lot of reversals, uh, when it comes to, you know, from the federal government, when it, when it comes to, you know, the, the, the policies on masks and everything and, and, and vaccines and everything else too, right. They're, they're, they're changing. The science is, is, is changing based on, on when, when, you know, the, the elections are coming up and, and it's, that's, that's a problem that, you know, that I, ha that I've got. So, yeah, but here we, here yeah, we go. Get ready, go ahead. Get ready for, sure. for another uh, tangent. Uh -huh. 
but change is what science does. That's why it's science, right? I mean, there, there's got to be some of that, a lot of that built into what the scientific method is. It's, it's supposed to change. Correct. But it's supposed to be valid science to begin with. And that was the problem that I've had from the get-go is that none of this was, was, you know, th these, the policies, wide sweeping policies were based, based on poorly conducted science and, and science that was never considered valid before, uh, what was was basically accepted and policies sweeping policies were made based on poor I science mean, so there's 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 good science and there's poor science and so the, yes and, the, and, and, and we the, we we agree on some of that yeah. we disagree on other pieces sure. of it like the yeah. the one thing that the one thing that we'll never be able to excuse or, or really move past in my opinion is this idea of the government lying to us about the effectiveness of masks because they didn't want us to make a run on masks. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I, I mean, mean, that that's, I'll never, I'm never going to get over that. And, and the, the other thing too, is, you know, using studies that were conducted by the manufacturers of the vaccines to say that they were safe and to say that there, there's nothing wrong with them instead of using third party testing and third party, you know, companies that, that would evaluate, you know, the, the effectiveness and the side effects and everything else of, of the vaccines, and then to make policies based on it, rather than saying, this is a risk, these are our known risks, and then and then basically, you know, being transparent with that. Yeah, I'd, I'd have you to know? look into that a little bit, because it does seem like, I mean, the, the way that drugs are almost always guided through the FDA's approval process is, I mean, of course, the company that's trying to make the drug is going to pay for the studies, because who else has an incentive to pay for the studies? Sure. How, however, the, the 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 policy in the past was you need to prove that they're they're safe before they're approved, and that was never done. And and so the FDA just allowed them to be to be used without being without being proven that they're safe. So it's it, it's a reverse of guilty as innocent until proven guilty. You're guilty until proven innocent, and that was not done. That 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 method was not done by the FDA, and I, that's the problem. I, I didn't know They're that still not done. The, yeah. the, the emergency authorization, the, the different rules that's not been, is that just a COVID-19 thing or has that been used before? Uh, I, I can't answer that. I don't know. I don't okay. know. Yeah. I need to, I need to I check on that because I mean, they did go out of their way to, to say, Hey, this is a different thing than you know, than we've, we've done on, you know, whatever antibiotic or painkiller mm -hmm. you're tanky, this emergency authorization is different. I just don't know if it's brand new different or if it's different that's just a good because question. it happens rarely i don't i don't know no, no that's that's a good question and i'm i'm almost uh i'm almost due for my my fourth uh booster yeah. and i have to decide if i'm if i'm going to if i'm going to do that or not i mean i've i've got a a coworker that just recently got covid again or not again it was her first time getting it but it's like oh yeah there's still people that are out there getting it for the first time which blows my mind you know so many months and years later that it feels yeah. like wouldn't everybody who's going to get it have gotten it by now and she was vaccinated, but she still caught it. Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah. I, you know, it, it really, you got to weigh the risks and the benefits. And I mean, if you're, yeah. gonna, if you're okay, you know, getting boosters all the time and it's still again, right. How, how, <laughs> And all the, you know, all the variants of, of COVID they're not, the boosters aren't going to be effective against all of those. And, yeah. and which, which booster to get. Right. And, and, and that's, that's the thing. It should be the end. Right. And it's like, it's just like your choice, whether you want to do it or not. And that's, that's the problem that I have is it was never really, it, it was difficult for you to maintain that independent choice throughout, sure. throughout this whole thing because of, you know, passport programs and, you know, and, and, and saying, you know, you need this, you have to have this. And then it's like, well, how, what's considered fully vaccinated at this point, right? Is it, right. you just had the first the two, two original and now yeah, yeah. you have to be boosted. And then to, to make sweeping public policy changes on that, that's the problem that I've got this, this whole time, you know, I mean, uh, yeah. Anyway, so yeah. we, we don't, we don't need to keep going and, and no, this course for sure. Here's, here's what I think we should do. Um, because you and I, I mean, I've, I've got a hard stop here in the next 34 minutes. So I don't know that we can give our first topic in our new series enough time, but we can introduce what we're planning on doing for the, the next sure. coming episodes and talk about it a little bit. And, uh, and then we'll, we'll jump in on the first, on, on the, on the next episode and we'll actually do the thing that we're, we're talking about doing. I like that. So idea. here, here was my idea that, uh, you have thankfully bought into. So, uh, <laughs> after we finished our, our coverage of 12 rules for life by Jordan Peterson, 
uh, you and I had a lot of discussions about what book should we do next? What book should we do next? And we really didn't, nothing jumped out at me or you that was like, here's what we have to jump into right, right now. And so what we're going to do is we're going to go a little bit topic based instead of book based for the next few episodes. And, um, you and I are going to go over our list of, uh, if not daily, then certainly weekly activities that you and I engage in that we find important to keep us feeling safe and happy and sane and effective in our personal relationships and effective in our careers. And we're just going to cover each of those things that we that we feel that we have to make a part of our of our daily or weekly life to make us function at our best. And these are not these are not going to necessarily be all the things that we do on a daily or weekly basis, but the things we feel like we need to be doing, because there are some of these uh, habits that I've got completely locked in stone where I just do them every day, no matter what. And there are some of them that I slack a little bit on and I don't do as often as I feel like I should. And I'm not at my best when I'm not. But uh, since I've decided that they're valuable, that means that they're worth sharing with people because somebody else might decide that they're valuable too. Yeah. And I, I mean, I'm, I'm on the same boat where I will start a habit and get a lot of value out of it and keep going with it. And then life gets in the way or it doesn't have enough value for me to kind of keep doing it at that right. time. And right. that's been part of my learning process because I used to feel guilty about that. It's just like, oh, I'm right. not journaling every day or I'm not meditating every day. And but then I start to feel guilty and that that's not helpful at yeah. all to, to feel that that guilt. And it's just part of this process has been putting that in perspective for yeah, me. We just talked about it in a recent episode. I don't know if it was the last one, the one before that, that training and exercise just doesn't feel like a priority for me right now. I know that it will be again soon, but really the only things that I'm doing physically is, is going for walks. And those walks are really more about the mental health aspect of it than the physical health. Cause I don't, I don't walk crazy distances and, and I don't walk at a brisk pace. So I'm sure there's some health benefit to it anyway, some you know physical benefit, but I mostly do it for the, the mental health of it. But uh, yeah, so let's talk about some of the things on our list and uh, we can just kind of go back and forth naming them until we run out. <laughs> so sure, uh, I'll go easy and I'll start with journaling. Uh, doing daily journaling is important to me. Um, I believe that this habit at its best for me would be a, a a two times a day occurrence where I do it in the morning and I do it at night. Right now I'm just doing it in the morning, but I, I would uh, like to use the, the opportunity that you and I are going to take to talk about journaling, you know, for one or two episodes to give me some fresh motivation to adopt a twice a day schedule, because I really think being able to say, here are my intentions for the day. And then here's how it went is, is probably the best way to, to do journaling in my opinion. So when, when we, uh, when we dive into it a little bit more detailed, that's what I'm hoping I'll be able to take away from that discussion is the, the fresh motivation to do it twice a day. I mean, every podcast we do, dude, is for me motivating yeah. in that same respect, right? It's motivating yes, absolutely. to to get into the, the chapters from Peterson on deeper basis or no more Mr. Nice guy, or even understand, you know, our guests and their perspective and their ideas on stuff. So a hundred percent, this is for me, if this is, this podcast is, is a little bit selfish because it helps. Oh yeah, absolutely. Gives me that motivation and helps me, you know, forces my brain to go, Hey, this is a new way of doing it. And that gets exciting for me. And then, and that, that's, that helps me get with it. So I agree with you on the, the two a day is, is, is a big, big difference. Yeah, the accountability part of this podcast is definitely huge because you can't talk about this stuff without feeling, okay, well, if I'm going to talk about it, I better live it. Yeah. Yeah. Or I'll, or I'll just be living my life feeling like a hypocrite all the time. And I, don't, I, I definitely don't want to do that. That makes me feel too bad. That kind of sucks. Yeah. So, okay. So journaling, that's, that's one. Okay. That's, that's probably the first one. What's, yeah. what, what else is on your list? So for me, meditating uh, and not meditating and falling asleep while doing it, because that's my <laughs> issue. Cause I don't count that as meditating. I used to for years. I really? thought that was normal because the, my, my transcendental meditation teacher would say, listen, your body's going to do what it needs at that time. So the fact is that you doze off for a second is okay. And it, it's not though. <laughs> it's not, there's a difference yeah. when I'm rested and I'm able to actually, you know, say my mantra for a good 20 minutes straight and, and do the meditation that way. But there's other forms of meditation that I have found didn't realize until I've been doing it, such as, you know, like walking outside and, and thinking about things, thinking through things, journaling to me is a form of meditation. And, and I'll get into that and why I think journaling is, is a form of meditation as well. 
Yeah, I'm a I'm a bit more of a stickler. I mean, and, you know, anybody's free to call whatever they want to meditating. If they if they get something out of it, I'm not going to be the guy, um, which is a relatively new development for me. I'm not going to be the guy saying, no, you're using the wrong word for the wrong thing. You have to stop. <laughs> right, right, right. But right. trying to get comfortable with that is is something that I'm definitely yeah. working on where it's like, yeah, you could you could call it what you want to call it. And that's OK with me. I uh, for me, I'm I'm pretty stuck in the idea of mindful mindfulness meditation sitting in a somewhat comfortable chair but not too comfortable where, where i don't have to worry about falling asleep that's my problem yeah so i i sit uh, either either in an office chair or in my little uh dining area in my camper here and it's it's fairly comfortable when i you know sit up straight with my feet flat on the ground my hands on my legs and then i just pay attention to either my breath or uh something in my visual field for about 10 minutes and uh i try to do that every day again i'm not perfect with that um you know, that's really another thing you could you could probably convince me that i should be doing it twice a day um you know sam harris really talks about getting into a place where you're in a constant state of meditation all during the day and you can just jump back into that mindfulness focusing on your breath and focusing on you know what thoughts are coming in and going out and and doing that basically without interruption all day where where you're you're not a far distance from that that place of mind and uh that i that really i could see that taking years to develop that that ability and and i'm not there yet so if i could just if i could just get that 10 minutes in uh one thing i do i've started doing during my even my short meditation sessions is starting it with a pen and pad in front of me so that if i do have something that keeps coming in that i can't i can't just let go of i'll just write it down and then i can say okay it's down i can worry about it later and i'm not going to focus on it anymore i like because that because sometimes something will pop into my head during a meditation session and i just cannot get it out yeah i don't i want to dig into that when we do our meditation podcast so uh your turn so i i did meditation okay. what are you, what, what what's something else you do uh let's see um going for walks that's that's a big one just uh and and i i don't put very many rules on what i do in the walks sometimes rarely i'll put in my airpods and listen to music most of the time i'm listening to a podcast or an audiobook um but just being outside and noticing the you know either my, what my neighbors are up to or the cat or the bird that uh that comes into my visual field or whatever but just just going for a walk and and not checking my phone every time that it dings or notifies me. Um, I like the idea of being able to go for walks and not taking my phone with me, but I get so much value out of podcasts and audiobooks, and it seems like such a great time to to engage in those activities. It's hard for me to decide to leave my phone at home. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I'm more likely to just put it on do not disturb and then listen to whatever I want to listen to. Yeah. Um, one for me is being my future butler. So Ooh, I, like I the heard of this. That. Yeah, I thought it was really catchy. So in the mornings, I listen to um, uh, an Amazon skill and uh, the and I, oh gosh, I'm drawing a blank in terms of the, the name of it. But um, she talked about a concept of being your future butler. And, and this what I was doing was basically setting myself, my future self up for happiness. And so I would, that's what I was thinking, uh, uh, you know, uh, initially and basically where I would clean up and, and organize my tape, my, my kitchen table so that the next time when I come and I do another meal, everything's clean, everything's where it should be. The napkins where it is, you know, and, and the, the, the placemat is clean. The, the, the dishes are washed and I'm ready to go. So it was kind of, and, and I would, I would thank, and I would, when I would do those things, even though when I was doing them, I'm like, I really don't want to do this. I just want to go off and, and do what I want to do and just leave it a mess. But as I'm doing it, I'm like, my future self's going to thank me for doing this. And so when I would come for that next meal, I would make sure that I thank my past self, right? I would say it out loud to myself or to my brain. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you for past Dan for doing this. But this one woman basically said uh, what she was doing, same thing. She was having an issue with cleaning. Instead of mm. cleaning as she goes along, she would have this huge mess at the end of the day. And right. it was just overwhelming. And she'd get upset. Yeah. So her husband, I think, had said something about or or she had said it's you know, somebody from her group said, hey, it's you're being it's like you have a butler because when you come back, it was like everything's clean and ready to go. So be your own future butler. 
put your clothes out. So I'll do, I'll put my gym clothes out for the very next day after I put them on for that day, I'll put out like my socks and underwear and everything else like that. So like little things, little ways that I can set my future self up for a little bit of nice pleasure. Like, Oh, Hey, Hey, look at this. This is all, you know, nice and made for me. Same thing. It's a similar concept of food prep. So that's something, all those, all those things. And we can, you know, talk about, Hey, how do we set ourselves up for future success? Maybe we can do a podcast on that. Yeah, and I can also see, I mean, that's great. I, I love the catchy name and I love the idea behind it. And and while you're talking about it, the thing that jumped out at me was that seems like, I, I know it would be hard to do in the midst of a depressive episode, but it really does serve as an affirmation when when you look at the product of, of doing that work for yourself, you can look at it and think, okay, I, I must be worth a damn because somebody took the effort to do this for me even though you're the one that took the effort to do it for you. Yeah. I like that. I like that. I didn't think of it that way, but yeah. that's a great way of thinking about it. Yeah. I, I look forward into to, to diving into that a little bit more so that I can prepare to talk about that. Cause that's definitely worth an episode. That idea is, that sounds great. I love mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. So let's see the next thing on my list is um, well, the first, the one I was going to talk about, which I think it, it maps too closely to yours. So we can easily bundle it together is the idea of just getting up and making my bed in the morning. Because when I am, when I've had a long day at work, especially if I'm working over in St. Pete and I've got that, you know, two and a half hour drive to get home, the image of my made bed in my mind of getting to come home and peeling back the the sheets and getting into that made bed, it just feels so nice when I'm, when I'm super tired. And it's even, it's even tired if I've been working all day or tired, I've been having fun all day and I'm, and it's time to go home. Just the, the image of that made bed in my mind just seems so relaxing to me. And so that, that is definitely one thing that helps me out. Yeah. I like that. I but like we'll, that. We'll, we'll bundle that with yours. So I'll sure. do another one because that one's too close to yours. Sure. Um, the cold shower thing, man. It, uh, I experienced a real nice benefit of it when I was at the beach the other day. And I knew that the water temperature at Daytona beach was only like 70 or 71. And normally I would be like, okay, well, that's just a day to enjoy the sun and the sand. Cause I am not getting in the water. But sure enough, I was like, you know what? I can, I can get in the water. I can, I can get some pleasure out of being in the ocean. That's a little cooler than I would normally like. And I did. And I did because I'm used to the cold showers now. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. You're a little less intimidated by that. Exactly. The thought of getting in that water. Yes. It felt invigorating and it felt exciting and it did not feel uh, overwhelming or uncomfortable. It just felt like, okay, this is a, this is a novel sensation that I would not have been able to enjoy six months ago. And so I, I felt good about that. That's great. Yeah. That kind of leads me to my thought of, for my other one, which is something that I've started to push myself a little bit, which is getting out of my comfort zone when in specific situations. So for example, I tend to not want to go out you know, and have late nights during the week and and do different things. And that I haven't done before, especially last night was one of those where I was really kind of questioning whether I wanted to go out on a, on a Thursday evening and uh, hang out, you know, uh, and, and explore a new, a new venue and a new event. But I, I said to myself, every time I do, it's always better than what I think it's going to be. And I Mm. always enjoy it. I always meet new people. I get to, you know, learn new things. And it was, it was fantastic last night. So for me, it's a regular practice of getting uncomfortable, trying new things and going to new places, meeting new people, even though my brain is like, nope, nope. I just want to stay in. This is, this is not something I'm going to enjoy. I say, thank you for trying to protect me brain. I I appreciate that's your job. I'm going to do this anyway. And I also think of, Hey, worst case scenario, I don't like it. I can leave, right? Right. It's being, uh, being that, that good ender, being able to, to not be locked into something that helps me get through that anxiety of this is going to be uncomfortable. I don't want to try this. It's if it's an easy out, um, um, it kind of greases the wheels and lets me get it done. So that's, that's something that I've been trying to do on a regular basis. I like it. Um, okay. Here's, here's another one for me, um, which seems like a no brainer given what this podcast is about, but, uh, spending time reading nonfiction and specifically books on, you know, self-improvement and personal development. That's, 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 that's been huge for me because 
and and we've talked about it on the podcast before the the crazy thing that i keep noticing the the more and more we we read books by you know experts in the fields of psychology philo- philosophy things like that it's so many there's so much overlap with what it takes to have a good life and a healthy life it's like they they repeat themselves and they hit the same themes just over and over and over again so it feels like okay well then either we're all sorely deluded or this stuff must be true <laughs> yeah no, that's good I, another one I, well yeah i was gonna say that's that's something that i i I probably should do the opposite and listen to more fiction books because I don't listen or read any of those. It's always nonfiction. Uh, same thing with podcasts and and uh, yeah, anything that I listen to on Audible. But for me, and you actually introduced me to this through the Way Better app, uh, yeah. is regularly committing to a program that is like, all right, look, you need to do these things. And for example, it was, you know, running a 5k and it was four runs a week for six weeks. And it doesn't sound that difficult on paper. And a lot of programs, especially like exercise or diet programs that I've seen on paper, you know, they look fairly easy, but then when the rubber hits the, when the rubber beats the road, I am guilty of this as well. I'll do it for like a week or so. And then I make my own changes to it, to make it easier, to make it adapt to myself. And with the way better app, you can't do that. You have to run or you have to do the, for example, on the, I'm in a push-up challenge right now and it's six days a week. It doesn't sound like much. It's just three sets of push-ups. Yeah. But as the day kind of goes on and you're getting busy with other things, yeah. it starts to get a little bit more difficult, you know, to get all six days in every single day and be consistent with that. So, but I, you know, I did the runs, I'm, I'm doing the push-up challenge and it, it, it feels good that I'm able to be consistent and I'm learning the value of the consistency, not that it's difficult, but the difficult part is being consistent. When I right. start doing it, it's easy, but, yeah, yeah. but taking the time out of your schedule and actually following through and doing it for a long period of time, six weeks or a month, that's the challenge. And I, and, and I made me appreciate how difficult it is to actually be consistent. Yeah, it's it's been uh, it's difficult for me as well. Um, And it starts out easy until, you know, you get into it. At some point where you feel like, oh, no, I I have to say no to something I'd rather do. And I have to to do this thing instead. Like, exactly. uh, That's when it gets hard. Exactly. Yep. No, you're you pinpointed it. That's 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 a great insight there. What's nice about that way better app is because you bet money. It's not a lot. It's like 25, 30 bucks. But and you're also in you've got that, that accountability of of being in a group. And so you're seeing how many people are still in the challenge and haven't lost or or have gone through uh, or have been kicked out. And that has helped me. Oh, no, I want to be part of the crowd. That's that's still in it. I want to win this thing. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's not really the money. It's just like, I don't want to be part of these ineligible people. Exactly. Yeah. I think uh, you just reminded me of something. Um, Remember a couple of years ago when when we used to do the uh, Fitbit challenges, like every, yeah, we do it on, I think, I mean, sometimes we'd do a week, a weekday one, and we would do a weekend one. And yep. uh, you were one of the people that was in the group that I would do it with. And we might need to create a uh, mindfully masculine group on Fitbit where we can uh, invite people to join and then and, and do those uh, step challenges every week. I think that could be fun. Oh, that would be great. And it'd be obviously that. open to all listeners, even even ladies. <laughs> By the way, to any ladies that happen to be listening to this, uh, please continue and tell your friends. We we want you <laughs> as much or more than the men. We really do. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I think I think I'll do that. Maybe I'll create a uh, a Fitbit group for us and then start sharing it on our social media and in our show notes so that uh, we can. I mean, so far, really nobody who listens to this podcast has taken any action whatsoever to reach out to let us know that they're there. <laughs> Whether it's sending us an email, writing a review, it's like, we believe you guys are out there, but uh, we don't know for sure. So maybe we'll uh, create a uh, Fitbit group and and maybe that'll be a nice low barrier to entry where we can uh, start uh, dealing with each other in some informal way. Yeah. Or we just have to keep going out to 
for for uh, dinner and drinks like we do with Kurt and Richard because they they give us wonderful feedback all the time. We appreciate it, guys. Uh, yeah, yeah. But so that, they I talk mean, about it. Yeah, all people so, all people we know that we actually have in our lives are yeah. happy to talk to them, talk to us about the podcast. But right. I have yet to talk to a stranger or interact with a stranger in any way who listens to the show. <laughs> and you would think I would appreciate that, but actually, I, I hunger for it. <laughs> it's great. Okay, so let's see. Uh, what else you got? What else do I have? Uh, well, therapy is a big one. I do that every week, mm. and that's that's a huge part of my life. And mm. uh, I I look. I mean, we talk about therapy a lot on this podcast, and I'm happy to do another episode with uh, Renata, your dad, Rob, whoever to uh, to talk about you know taking that first step of getting into therapy. That would be that would be a good a good way to spend an episode. I think. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, I would I would definitely like to do that. Um, uh, for me. My other one, and it sounds very kind of granular, but uh, weighing my food with every every time I eat. Oh, interesting. Um, with the exception of going out, I don't I don't bring my scale with me. But at home, I do it. Um, you know, mostly, partly because I'm I'm a type one diabetic, and it's important that I know exactly the amounts of of carbohydrates and protein that I'm eating, so I can adjust with with an insulin bolus. However, mm. it also it makes me more conscience conscious. <laughs> <laughs> of what I'm eating and, right. you know, looking at it a little bit more than just like throwing it down my mouth or, <laughs> it, you know, on the, on the, on the stove, it's okay. How much of this am I eating? Do I really, and then it gives me a chance to actually figure out how hungry am I, what I'm looking at, does that line up with how hungry I am and how hungry I'm feeling? And is that enough? And also what is this that I'm eating? What am I putting in my mouth? What, what's uh, what is this food exactly? And it just gives me a little bit more time to slow down and be a little bit more conscious of, of what I'm eating. I like that. I would not have, uh, I would not have thought of that one. Um, okay. Let me see what else. Uh, hmm. I mean, keeping my, my living space sort of clean and organized. That's another one, but that, that uh, you, you already have the catchiest way to refer to that about being, being your own Butler. So I, I like that. So let me keep thinking. Um, hmm. Okay, here's one that uh, here's what I definitely need to do more of, um, mostly on the personal side, but one could make an argument that you should do this in your career as well, which is to just check in with the people close to you in either, you know, formal or informal ways about how they feel about your relationship to them. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Like, and again, it's, it's very easy to to end up doing this in a way that's weird and and yeah. feels awkward, but I think I think there's a way that you can figure out how to do this, both personally and professionally. To say, you know, hey, I value this connection you and I have. How do you feel about what you're getting out of it? But yeah, that that's interesting. I I'd, I'd like for us to take that on in terms of figuring out the way to approach that and the the right questions to ask so that they feel actually comfortable being honest and and being yeah. straightforward with you. I think yeah, we, I think there's a lot of to, value in that if you can approach it the right way. Let's find an expert who's either written about it or is willing to talk to us about it and see, you know, how how we can make that practice a regular part of our our lives and our relationships with other people to say, "Hey, I I want you to know I value this connection and I'm interested in feeling and finding out if you feel like it's meeting your needs. Yeah. Now let's get to the bottom of that. That feels like a, a worthy time for us to spend our time and energy, a worthy Absolutely. way for us to spend our time and energy. Yeah. I, I bet you um, Brene Brown covers that in some respect. Oh, yeah. In I'm some sure way. I bet so, you she's got yeah. a, a way to handle that. But that's that's definitely great. Yeah, when I go when I when I take on going through her books, I'll bet I'll 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 have the highlighter handy so that I can uh, I can make a re- make some notes on that. All right, what else you got? Um, for me, every once in a while, I will tell myself something my mom used to tell me as a kid, which is slow down. Mm. So that's something that I try to regularly remind myself when I'm feeling super excited about something, or if I'm upset about something, or if I've just dropped something on the floor, (laughs) uh, slow down. Yesterday I was, I was driving, hit a bunch of traffic and I would, you know, I, I sat there and I was just like, I was anxious. I was running a little bit late. 
And I, you know, I basically, I, I caught myself, did some belly breath, but some belly breathing, which is mm-hmm. maybe something else we can talk about that definitely helps uh, calm yeah. things down and just, you know, said, slow down. And it just, you know, kind of brought me back in a moment. And, and it was like, all right, look, this is traffic that I have no control over that I'm not going to do anything about. And let's just, let's just slow down. And it made that journey a little bit more enjoyable. Yeah. I had a talk with someone recently about the, uh, about, you know, deep breathing to get yourself out of what feels like, you know, a, a moment of crisis or panic. And it's just so interesting that the way it signals your body, where if you can stop and breathe deeply, you're basically telling your body, okay, look, you're, you're definitely not being chased by a predator right now. If you were being chased by a predator right now, you couldn't possibly slow down your breathing. So you must be in some manner, you must be okay right now. Yeah. Your body believes you when you do it. Yeah. That's the difference. I think between just breathing up here in your diaphragm versus that, or uh, up in your chest versus your belly and kind of making you sure that your belly kind of extends as you breathe in, you force those, you know, that, that deep diaphragm breathing and that, that, you know, triggers a whole bunch of cascades of, of different hormones. So yeah, exactly. Tell your body you're not under attack. Yeah, that's, uh, that's interesting. I'm, I'm really interested in, in getting more into the practice of how can I interrupt my body and my mind when something's not going the way that I want it to go to, whether it's, you know, a difficult conversation with a loved one or a stressful work situation. It's like, what are the systems I can put in place that allow me to interrupt, you know, when, when my, my body's autopilot wants to take over, cause it's like, okay, we're in danger. It's time for me to hijack mm-hmm. your brain and your emotions and your logical thinking and, and let the lizard part of my brain take over because we're about to die. It's like, what can I do to, to throw a, an interrupt into that process to say, no, 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 things aren't as bad as you think they are. Let's, uh, let's start thinking again and figure out a way out of this, out of this negative feedback loop you're about to engage in. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the things that was sold to me about meditation is that the more often you practice that, the easier you can do what you just said, right. You have that, that uh, that awareness to go, well, well, and actually it happened to me the other day. I was dropping my car off at the dealership to get serviced Mm -hmm. and they, you know, one of the sales guys came out and said, Hey, you know, we could give you a nice little offer on, on your used Mm -hmm. car. You don't want, you want to take a look at some of the new ones. And I went for a couple of test drives and, and, you know, worked out some numbers. They were giving me what I thought was very generous offer for my car as a trade-in. Yeah, I was, and all I needed to do is leave the keys and I could have walked out with like no money down, you know, yeah, yeah. And a little bit of a payment to, you know, with, with a brand new version of my car. Right. And I was literally a few seconds, one signature away from doing that. Whoa. And I caught myself and I said, you know what? I need to slow down. I need to get a little bit more information. Yeah. Um, you know, and I, you know, nicely said, no, thank you right now. I'll, I'll let you know. I went back home. I Googled what my car was worth. And it turns out um, I would have lost about $4,000 on, uh, on the trade-in had I gone forward with it, even wow. though I thought it was generous. And it was, I just got caught up in the moment. I was super right. excited. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I did some belly breathing and I said, listen, whenever things seem really exciting, let's pause, let's take more time. If I don't know, if I'm not a hundred percent sure, if I'm not hell, yes, I'm going to just, my, my rule of thumb is let's just pause and wait. And, and so that, that helped. And, and that's a, I mean, that's a great point. Cause when I brought it up, I wasn't, I was only thinking about it from the negative aspect, but it it can certainly happen to you through the excitement process as well. Not, right. Not just the, Oh, I don't like what's going on. I need to, you know, go into survival mode, but it can also happen when you want to make things better than they actually are. I I'm pretty much out of ideas and I think we're pretty much out of time. So you cool with winding it up there. Yeah. I think that works out well. All right. Awesome. Now I just got to come up with a way to title this and uh, figure out uh, what we, what we, your, your titles are great. I'm not worried about that at all. We we need to come up with a a good name for this series of, of all these practices that we're going to recommend to people. Yeah. Yeah. Or at least share. Like, I don't know if it's strong enough to be a recommendation, but we're just going to tell people about it and they can decide if they like it or not. Something, something about habits or something. I think. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. I'll, I'll get to the, uh, you know, one of these, one of these, uh, Disney nights where I'm out till two or three in the morning, I'll just let something occur to me and, uh, and that'll be it. Hey, that's great. That's great. <laughs> All right, man. We'll take care. I'll see you later tonight at the, uh, at the dance and, uh, have a great day. Yeah, I'm excited. Yep. I'll see you soon. All right. Take Bye-bye. care. Bye. Thanks so much for spending time with us on the mindfully masculine podcast. 
If you liked the episode, or you think it would be useful for someone else, please leave us a review and join the Mindfully Masculine group on Facebook. Remember, fellows, don't act masculine. Be masculine. Thank you.